Hi there, and welcome to the Nerds of Business podcast. My name is Darren Moffat. I'm a director at WebBuzz, the growth marketing agency, and I'm your host. It's great to have you with us for episode four of our series on the mindset of the disruptive entrepreneur. If you're the kind of person who struggles with motivation, then this episode will definitely help you. However, if you're already pretty motivated, but you're looking for an edge in business or in life, then I think what you're about to hear, you'll find really quite fascinating. Before we delve into the psychology of elite entrepreneurs, to set the scene, we start today's show with a few mystery quotes from the worlds of art, literature, and history. Here's the first one. Talent is cheaper than table salt. What separates the talented individual from the successful one is a lot of hard work. That's the famous horror writer and author Stephen King. He's published dozens of titles, sold millions of books around the world, and had his stories made into countless films. So he knows a thing or two about work ethic. See if you can guess who said these words. I attribute my success to this. I never took or gave an excuse. That quote is from the famous founder of modern nursing, Florence Nightingale. Her tireless efforts in providing care to soldiers in the 1800s reduced the mortality rate to about 2% and bought her fame in England, where she was the first ever woman to be awarded the Order of Merit. And our final quote today comes from Italy. If people knew how hard I had to work to gain my mastery, it would not seem so wonderful at all. Those words are from the famous Renaissance artist, Michelangelo. What's interesting about this quote is the admission that hard work is far from glamorous. In his eyes, there's no mystery at all to what people have regarded for centuries as sublime creations touched by the hand of God. Of course, he's being modest. But if there's one modern-day figure who regularly captures the public's imagination in a similar way... It's the entrepreneur who's the focus of our opening story. As you're about to hear, although he too is famous for wondrous creations that seemingly spring from the future, much of his achievement is actually the rather mundane product of long and sustained toil. The year is 1982. The Commodore VIC-20 is the first home computer to become widely available when a 10-year-old boy by the name of Elon Musk discovers the joys of computing. He teaches himself how to code and before long he's become proficient enough to create Blast Star, a video game in the style of Space Invaders. He sells the game to a magazine publisher or $500. Shortly after, Musk and his brother plan to open a video game arcade near their school. Their planning for the venture is so advanced that the only thing stopping them from opening is the need for a city permit, for which an adult has to apply. Remarkably, Elon Musk is just 14 years old. Fast forward 10 years and Musk enrolls in a PhD of applied physics at the prestigious Stanford University. He lasts just two days before leaving to become an entrepreneur. In 1995, he launches his first company, a startup called Zip2. The company develops and markets an internet city guide for the newspaper industry. According to Musk, when he isn't running the website during the day, he's coding all night, seven days a week. Just four years later, he sells the company for $307 million. He immediately launches another startup called X.com, a financial services and email payment company. X.com goes on to merge with a company called Confinity. It changes its name to PayPal, and although Musk is ousted from the company before it's sold to eBay for $1.5 billion, he does leave with $180 million in stock. In 2002, he forms SpaceX with the goal of commercialising space travel. After three failed attempts, SpaceX succeeds in launching the Falcon 1 in 2008 to become the first private liquid fuel rocket to reach Earth's orbit. By this stage, Musk is both the CEO and chief engineer. 
In 2003, he invests in an electric vehicle startup, Tesla, and within a few years, he becomes the CEO and chief product architect. Tesla released the first electric sports car, the Roadster, just five years later, and in 2010, Musk takes the company public. Around this time, journalists begin to quiz him on his remarkable work ethic and drive. He famously admits to sometimes working 120 hours a week and says that to get ahead, entrepreneurs must be putting in at least 80-hour work weeks. In 2016, he co-founds Neuralink, a neurotechnology company with the audacious goal of developing brain-to-computer interfaces. It promises to deliver the world's first cyborg. In 2021, as SpaceX gears up for its first private spaceflight with civilian crew, Elon Musk announces he's to sell all of his many homes. Because by this stage, his famous work ethic has become so all-consuming that he is living full-time in a 50-square-metre unit on the SpaceX compound. On social media, he admits to no longer having a need for housing. While critics question the safety and sustainability of what Musk himself describes as a super-hardcore work ethic, the results are undeniable. In the space of 25 years, he launches or leads eight companies and amasses the world's largest fortune with a net worth of $250 billion. He becomes a truly historic figure, and it's only possible because of an all-consuming drive. Now, many of you would be vaguely familiar with the Elon Musk story, but even I was surprised by the sheer scale of his output. It's hard to believe, but there were plenty of achievements that I had to live off the summary you just heard. There simply wasn't enough space. And here's a fun fact. He's even the inspiration for the Iron Man character in the Marvel movies. When it comes to why he works so hard, I think it's best to hear it in his own words. Work like hell. I mean you just have to put in 80 to 100 hour weeks every week. This improves the odds of success. If other people are putting in 40 hour work weeks and you're putting in 100 hour work weeks, then even if you're doing the same thing, you know that you will achieve in four months what it takes them a year to achieve. That seems like a very logical approach to the arithmetic of productivity. The harder you work, the more output you can deliver, and the sooner you achieve your goals, right? But in the case of Elon Musk, and indeed all elite entrepreneurs, is that all that's really going on here? What role does ego play? How strong is the need to prove you're the smartest, richest, and even the most historic amongst your peer group? I was struck by how early his incredible drive began to manifest itself. He was just 11 or so when he shipped his first product and banked his first profit. Where does that come from? And can it be learned and developed? If you're running a company or about to launch a startup, what can you do to maximize your output and achieve superhuman feats of endurance that will leave your competitors for dead? I love data. I I love kind of looking through the data. You need to have systems, you need to have structure. You're going to get chopped to pieces. Enthusiasm is unstoppable. We kind of hit a point where we were like, we need another leader. Surround yourself with people who are smarter than you and richer than you. (laughs) This is Nerds of Business. We'll start the show in a minute, but first, a word from our sponsor. Hi everyone, it's your host, Darren here with a special announcement. We've launched a new website for the show at nerdsofbusiness.com. You can find all the episodes, transcriptions and information on our guests at this new address. So come and take a look at nerdsofbusiness.com. And while you're there, sign up to our newsletter for early access to unreleased content and special offers that we'll be releasing real soon. It's the best place to totally nerd out. All systems operational. So the title of today's episode and the problem we're trying to solve is Superhuman Work Ethic. How to leverage ambition and competitiveness to boost your entrepreneurial drive. 
It's a massive show today and we've got some amazing guests to get you inspired. Up soon you'll hear from a business psychologist, a senior leader in the startup world and the founder of a tech platform disrupting financial services with a new take on the buy now pay later model. But first, here's just a quick reminder that if you're enjoying Nerds of Business to please hit the subscribe button on your podcast player. It means you'll automatically receive each new episode every fortnight and it makes it easier for us to stay in touch. Stephanie Thompson is a qualified psychologist and business coach based in Sydney, Australia, with over 25 years' experience helping executive leaders and entrepreneurs to optimise their mindset and performance. She's the founder of her practice Insight Matters, and she's regularly in the media, appearing on the ABC, Channel 9, the Financial Review, and more. So, We're very lucky to have her as our technical expert for this series on entrepreneur mindset. I began by asking her to deconstruct the psychological components of drive, and she goes on to reveal some strategies that leaders can use to maximise their own performance in this regard. Actually, there are a lot of components of drive. They're quite varied as well. So there are some biochemical drives. Ah, So things like neurotransmitters like dopamine, So dopamine is the reward uh, neurotransmitter that makes us want to um, try and to uh, attain a goal. Uh, Physical energy, mental energy, uh, hormones even like testosterone, of course, is classic. And also thyroid hormone can affect motivation. Mm -hmm. Then there are some intangible or more sort of psychogenic uh, factors like a sense of purpose or even fear can function as a motivator, not the best one to have, but it can function. And traits like enthusiasm or competitiveness or even diligence. Wow. Okay. So it's really very multifaceted. I mean, it's, um, Mm. I think you you probably reeled off nearly a dozen sort of components there. I mean, obviously some of those are uh, innate or to do with the way the body is wired. Uh, Mm -hmm. But when it comes to those, the, perhaps the latter set that you just outlined there, like enthusiasm and and so on, can these be learnt? What can Mm -hmm. entrepreneurs do within their power to increase their drive? Well, hmm. exercise is one thing. So then that's a a nice practical thing that gets the whole machinery whirring. Um, That's a very good option. Enthusiasm somewhat, yes. You can learn to think more positively and speak and... um, feel more positive about things. That's quite a big one, actually. So there's even a whole field around the learning of optimism. Mm -hmm. Um, That's worth considering. Eating well, moving well, uh, keeping an eye on physical health too. So things like thyroid hormone. Can you you explain what thyroid hormone is? So um, I know Mm -hmm. broadly the thyroid is a a gland or it's an organ, but, but what... What does it do and why is it important when it comes to drive and energy? It's a master gland and it has a lot to do with metabolism and the sense of energy in the body. There are other factors that drive the production of energy, but thyroid hormone has a big role in that and a lot of impact as well on mental health. So when you're when you have the right amount of thyroid hormone, it seems to support dopamine, at least subjectively. That's it seems to be that way, and it creates a a natural energy and motivation. Whereas if thyroid hormone is too low, which can happen in some conditions, you can feel a little bit cold, a little bit tired, a little bit subdued, not so chipper. Wow. So the the take out there for listeners is that, of course, the mindset, you know, the, the mental stuff is, is really important. Much of it can be learned or improved upon. But there is such, it seems to me, there is such a significant physical component to this. The physicality mm. of, of business people and entrepreneurs, particularly when it comes to this drive and energy, seems to be super important. It is super important. Yes, I think I do think a lot of it is innate. I think the dopamine and testosterone seem to be key innate drivers and that people are just always that way, very driven or not. But there are other variables too, yes. Okay, and on a related question, you know, the topic of ambition, that's obviously something that's been studied and written about for the ages. You know, even Shakespeare was 
writing about ambition. Um, don't want to get too uh, too nerdy for people, but you know, what's the clinical definition, if I can put it that way, of ambition, and and how does this kind of fold into the drive? Ambition really is a goal motivation. So what that goal is is open to in preference, but it's wanting to reach great heights in some way. Again, there are various sources. So quite a lot of it is actually cultural mm. in that in our capitalist Western urban culture, this wanting to get somewhere, do something, achievement, the measurement of achievement and that concept of what gets measured gets done or what's, what's valued gets done. Um, I, I think that's a big factor. It's there's also a mysterious aspect to it in a way. Some have it, some don't. It can also vary across a lifetime. Like I notice in some executives, they get to a certain level and ambition falls away, as you might expect, really. It's getting to the top of the mountain and saying, Well, I've arrived actually. So ambition doesn't play much of a role in my reason for getting out of bed every morning now. That's understandable. I mean, and so when you said before that it's it's a goal motivation you know do you find in your experience talking with your clients that ambition tends to work better when it's focused on an external factor or when it's focused on something within that's an interesting question i don't know that it would be more effective one over the other they're both valid so yes there's a, a tangible external goal we could think of something classic like uh, winning a uh, getting into the the medal rankings at the olympics real Mm -hmm. tangible goal or something more personal that might be even ego driven. So to be somebody in inverted commas, so having a job title or um, being a bit narcissistic or just legacy or creative ambition. So I want to make something, have an impact on an industry or an issue, all valid. Stephanie will return later in the show with some fascinating insights into how competitiveness and passion play into entrepreneurial drive. So we know what drive is, but why is it so important in a founder? And how do investors validate this in the entrepreneurs that pitch them for investment? Rachel Newman is the founder of Flying Fox Ventures, an early stage venture firm for angel investors based in Melbourne, Australia. Prior to that, she was the managing director of Eventbrite for Australia and New Zealand and the head of startups at Amazon Web Services, where she worked with literally thousands of entrepreneurs. She's also served as the chair of Startup Oz, Australia's national startup advocacy and lobbying group. So she's a highly respected leader in the startup ecosystem who knows what it takes to be a disruptive entrepreneur. Have a listen to what Rachel has to say on the topic of entrepreneurial drive. I want to say that it's, I'm going to preface this because it's not, it's not important for everyone. It's just important if you want to be a VC backed company who has expectations of certain growth trajectory over time and returns. And so I just want to give a shout out to all of the founders out there who don't want to have big global businesses, who don't want to, you know, do triple, triple, double, double, double growth rates who don't want to be global. That is totally cool. And I love and respect your work. It's just not the type of company that I'm going to invest in, but high five to you. Um, And so I want to make sure that we know that when I'm talking about these expectations of ambition and growth, I'm talking very specifically about a venture backed type of company. Yes. Um, because there are so many ways to do this world, right? So I think that for a venture-backed company, um, and this goes back to our portfolio conversation. So in a portfolio, in an early stage, at least half of those companies statistically are going to die. In the half that lives, you only have a you know, few that will give you maybe a one to three X return, even fewer that will give you a three to five X return. And then you need one or two companies to do a big return that does all the work all the work for those who died and those that gave you meager returns. Yep. And so what that means is that every company you invest in needs to have a shot at being that one or two percenters that are going to return the fund. And you never know which ones in the fund are going to do that or in the portfolio. And so that is why I'm looking for really ambitious founders 
taking on big problems in large and growing spaces because I need each one to have the potential to be a big returner, to make up for the fact that many of my investments, even though I love them all dearly, and right now none of them are dead, but statistics tells us that some of them will die. So for me, you know, in Australia, got a bad rap about this. So I know over the last, I mean, I've been in Australia for more than 10 years and over the last 10 years, there's been a lot of harsh people saying that, you know, Australian founders aren't as ambitious or there's tall poppy syndrome. I actually don't see that. Um, I think that ambition and talent sure is equally distributed, but access to opportunities to exercise that ambition has not been. And then also a really important tipping point was there just it just wasn't as socially acceptable to go on this founder journey and i'm so pleased to see how every year or every week that's just getting better and better um, and I, i'm seeing talent come from the traditional sectors um, and rushing into being entrepreneurs so that's that's awesome um ambition and this is where i'm involved with startmate which is uh, an accelerator here in australia um and Startmate calls it themselves, you know, the most ambitious accelerator. And I think that the one thing, I mean, it, they accelerate as many good things, but one of the great things that they do is they help to level up founders' ambition. So they come into the program being very ambitious and 12 weeks, weeks later, they 10X that ambition. Yep. And I think that that's just what you need to do. You need to set your sights on something so big um, because that's, that's what everyone can tap into. If your ambition is small and it's more of a tactical goal, to my earlier comment, it's hard to get all of the team to get excited about that, to wake up every morning and eat the <laughs> that you might have to eat that day <laughs> to <laughs> execute against it. Yeah, yeah. If you're working towards something small, but if you're all bought in to something big and meaningful, right? Everyone is thinking about meaning and impact. That's what gets people out of bed. Not what is the report I need to run today or what's the product feature I need to ship. It's all about impact and meaning. And so if you can set that ambition so that everyone can tap into that higher purpose, you know, that's how you're going to keep folks. You're going to attract talent to your team. You're going to attract great customers and you're going to keep uh, folks coming back for more. So that's where ambition is important. One, from an investor perspective, that's where returns come from. And two, that's how you build the right team and mindset in order to achieve it. And from an investor perspective, um, how do you validate that in a founder? So, you know, um, it, you know, smart founders will, will present, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll present well, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll tell you what they think you want to hear. But how do you validate that, that deep sense of ambition and drive in a founder? You must have a yeah, system. So- yeah, well, it's past experience. So past experience is the best predictor of future. Um, and so, you know, one of our founders, for example, he and his brother were immigrants, came to this country, not speaking the language, having no money, had to hustle like crazy just to, you know, get to school every day. Yep. Um, and what they have been able to do in their business, which is Annika, like, has been pretty phenomenal. And so, you know, you look at past adversity, And you see how have these people uh, fared in the face of adversity. Um, I also look for, you know, not everyone needs to come from, you know, humble beginnings or challenges, but you look at, do they have a track record of excellence? So no matter what they were given, if they were, you know, raised in Sydney in the Eastern suburbs and went to private school, how did they maximize every inch of that privilege they were given? And so I look for track records of excellence or track records of, um, you know, wanting more, pushing, you know, pushing the envelope. Pushing, pushing, yeah. And so that so, just, that, sorry. You know, I was just going to say, so I ask a lot of questions, not like, how would you deal with this? But like, tell me about a time when you did. Right. And, so and it's a lot of conversations. It's a lot of conversations. Yeah. Absolutely. And in that first conversation, when you meet a founder, it's a 30 minute call usually. And I'm spending about 15 minutes getting to know the pro- the problem, the product, the space. And then the other 15 minutes is us getting to know each other. I want to deeply understand who they are as a person, what motivates them, what brought them to this moment. That's always the first question I ask. I say, I know about you. I've looked at you at LinkedIn. Tell me like what brought you to this moment? And that's where I want to see that journey. And then likewise, I want them to get to know me. It's a two-way street and uh, they need to want to work with me, feel like they have chemistry 
Um, and I, I know that often the power dynamic is disproportionate and I want to make sure that, you know, they grill me as much as I grill them. And now for the first of our entrepreneur guests, John T. Hersevitz is the co-founder and CEO of Defer It. Defer It is a tech platform with a new take on the buy now, pay later model. It allows people to pay bills such as phone and utilities over for installments. Launched in Sydney, Australia back in 2017, they've already amassed 250,000 users and recently raised $15 million in a Series B funding round. They're growing like crazy and over the last 12 months, they've increased their customer base by 150%, saving its users about $10 million in late fees. I asked Jonty to share his origin story and to reveal the key character traits that he's relied upon to break through the inevitable tough times. What you're about to hear, I think, is essential listening for any startup founder who wants to succeed. Uh, so it actually it, ca- it came about, um, the idea started percol- percolating from, um, I was actually looking to potentially do a prop tech startup, so something completely different. And via the conversations of that startup, I started noticing people were saying, um, especially property owners, that they were like the worst thing for them was paying um, the outgoings on property and that there was no way to budget for them. And mm-hmm. at the same time, BNPL was doing really well. And so the cog star started kind of like ticking um, in that regard. And then Matt, who's my co-founder and I, we decided to take a surfing trip. Um, he's an avid surfer, got me into surfing. And we took a surfing trip down to WA. And on that trip, we was I, I clearly remember it was in Margaret River. We're sitting on the beach and we were basically talking. He said to me that he had a thing. It was like a car rego and something else. And I had an electricity bill and we had just paid for the trip. And we talked about how we both dipped into our credit cards to pay for it. Mm. Um, and at, the, at that point of time, I, I can't remember who said it, but one of us said, well, if this is an experience to like both of us are experiencing and we both work in finance and are paid fairly well, and we've had to dip into a credit card and we know most people don't want credit cards anymore and are starting to like move away from them. What does the average person do and how does the average person budget? And so when we came back to Sydney, basically we came up with the idea of, okay, what happens if we could transpose the payment method from buy now, pay later, which people really like, but transpose it into this new category for bills, which we now call bill now, pay later, which is quite similar. Mm -hmm. But how... Could, could we transpose it and would people want to use it? And that was the thesis we started to to run with. So it really came from that from that discussion and and potentially even from that previous experience where the idea was kind of percol- percolating a bit. So, uh, yes, it came from that surfing trip, which was in 2017, I believe. So it's uh, it's really not very long ago. So this, this whole journey is still really quite fresh and young, four years or so. Um, and... Uh, How's the surfing? Uh, have you improved uh, since then, or are you, uh, you still a little rough? Uh, I think I've dramatically improved. I um, so back then not so good, but yeah, I surf about three, four times a week now. So oh, that's pretty um, serious. Yeah, I'm I'm, I'm hooked. It's uh, it's probably one of the. Just look, my mind's very active, and I'm always thinking about the business and what we can be doing, and all of that. And I find even you know it's it's probably one of the things I want to work on is sometimes you're having discussions with people you're at a dinner and you're thinking about work or it's in your brain and you're not fully present yeah. i find surfing is probably the only thing i do when i'm sitting on the board on the water where i'm not thinking about work so for me it's also a bit of a meditative break from from everything but it's yeah i think it's one of the greatest sports um out there i've played a few but none have had that effect on me as surfing has and um, what about the sharks question? I know we're, we're taking a very sort of weird and wonderful digression here for a minute, but do you ever sort of, you know, worry about the sharky water, sort of them, what, what might be out there or it doesn't bother you? I used to. When you first take it up, you have that um, fear. But yeah, I surf at Bondi, I think like I just look at it as statistical probability. There's been like two shark attacks there since the 1930s. If you look at how many people kind of um, swim in that water and you work out the probability, like you, you're more li- likely to get hit by a car. So mm. um, I, I probably go at times when I shouldn't, like super early when the sun hasn't even risen or like as sunsets happening. Um, but yeah, I, I have no fear at the moment. You get used to it and then you just build a sense of confidence, which 
look, anything can happen, but that's like life, isn't it? Well, it's a metaphor. You know, you're out there with the sharks in the water. I'm sure you're mixing <laughs> with some sharks in the business world. That's to use a very bad pun. And now I'd like to turn, you know, turn to what I call the mindset of the disruptor, um, if you will. So, uh, you know, you're, you're sitting at the, the top of a very fast-growing startup. You're, you're clearly disrupting a, a giant, you know, the collective uh, banking industry of Australia. Um, that's fascinating in of itself. What personality traits do you find yourself drawing on most uh, so far in the defer it journey? Uh, look, in terms of personality traits, it's, I'd say the, the hardest part of doing a startup is obviously it comes with different challenges and it comes at different stages. So when you launch in, the hardest part is like actually saying, is there like, am I solving a problem here? Can I even get customers? And you face so much uncertainty at that point. And so there's a lot of self doubt that you have to like kind of stick to your guns. And also you chat to people and they say, oh, you won't get any customers or it won't work. So there's that element in the first part. And then once you've established like, hey, we can actually get customers, we got product market fit, we're in scale up phase. It comes with all different sorts of challenges of making sure you have enough infrastructure, people, support to actually sustain that growth. I think the one thing I've kind of, um, and Matt's got a very different skill set to me, but personally I can speak for myself. The one thing I've really relied upon was coming from that sort of traditional, um, I guess, traditional corporate sphere where it's not really a nine to five job. Like when I used to work in law, I used to, on average, I think I'd finish it on a good night at 10 or 11 at night. It's weird. I didn't really enjoy doing that. And I always used to complain about it, but it changes your behavior. And what it's done is like, and it's not something like to like be proud of, but what it's done is it's given me the ability when we've been in really tough situations to basically be able to sit down for, you know, 18 hours per day and go and four or five hours sleep and fix the problem with Matt and have that kind of conviction and that ability to work under that pressure. So for me, it's really just the ability to kind of like nut down. And when we have a problem, just say we, we, we're not going to bed until we fix it. So it's, it's um, thanks for sharing that. That's a, a really incredible insight. So it's really a mix of endurance and perseverance. You would say are probably some really key traits for you that have really pushed you through some, some tough spots so far. Yeah, and I, and I think it's a tricky thing because sometimes when you're doing something, it's not, it, like having perseverance might be a bad thing. Like if you're trying to solve something and like there's no product market fit and you're just being super perseverant, which like that's that was always my biggest fear. Are you pushing something that like maybe just shouldn't be pushed and it's like there's no solution for it and it's not a product that people want. Mm. But w- once you get the conviction that like you're solving something, people want it, you're helping people and you see traction, that perseverance and ability to work um, hard on, on what you're trying to solve is really important and having the passion to want to be able to do that as well. And, and passion, that's a, that's a great thing. Let's talk about that for a minute. So um, your vision, which you articulated right at those, the top of the, uh, the chat, was to really uh, help people, help consumers solve this bill problem, yeah? And so how do you use the passion for that to not only sort of uh, articulate the vision and, and, you know, sort of really drive the mission across the team, but to actually... Get the brand, create a brand that has a real vibe and presents as a lived experience for the customers. Well, I, th- I think it's a twofold thing. So on Matt's side, um, and it's going back to what I was originally talking about, his whole thing was he didn't want to do the business unless it could help people. Mm-hmm. So that vision, it's, that's been really important. So it's it's formed our DNA. When we, whenever we hire new people, it always gets covered and it attracts a certain type of person. So a lot of people we hire, they'll come to us and say, we really want to work for you because you're actually helping people. Yeah. So it number one, it brings like-minded people, but number two, it creates this kind of social cause within the organization where we have this culture where we actually feel like we're helping people get through some tough times when they ordinarily wouldn't have. And that's very powerful. Um, And then in terms of just like how passion can kind of fuel it, I I guess for us, because we don't really like, ultimately, like we, we both come from a financial background, but we've never really done this sort of business before. The constant learning new things and the fact like we both genuinely interested in 
um, you know, bill payment rails, the way to operate a loan book, the way like the way the tech platform works, the way how do you onboard marketing? Like we've learned a ton about marketing and how to market to customers we've had no experience before. That constant learning, that constant of like, how do we get more people? How do we get more bills? How do we help more people? That really drives us. It's something Matt and myself, like we love it, right? So we love learning new things, learning new skills. I learned probably five, six new things every day, constantly challenging yourself. And it's the combination. It's of it's it's learning new things, that passion. You have to be you have to like be genuinely um, feeling it. Otherwise I think it, it you do want to kind of give it up at a certain point. And then the second element is it's it's great to have it because if you have it, it it's infectious. People pick up on it and it attracts a certain kind of people or like people to work with you, which is great as well. Yeah. Um absolutely. And Here's a bit of a nature versus nurture question. I mean, do you think disruptors are born that way or can they evolve? And which applies to you? Oh, it's a, that's a, it's a tough one, Darren. I think, I think ultimately, there, look, there's an element of luck involved in terms of where, where you come from as well. So certain types, of, like if you come from a very disadvantaged background, I think it's really hard to depending on the product or problem you're trying to solve and they have people who have done it and those are the stories everyone hears about and it's kind of champions um it's much harder and on a probability basis your chances of succeeding are much lower but it is possible so i definitely think you can come you you can come from an like an environment where probably you weren't nurtured and do it but ultimately when you come in you know if you grow up in a capital city compared to a regional place or you know just all these external factors that a lot of people can't control i think it has a huge influence in their ability to to succeed i do think though if you have like if you can overcome that or even if you come from you know a city environment you've you've gone you've done a good job you've you've kind of come from that background there you don't really need to be like i always used to think like i never thought like um if you if you spoke to me 10 years ago i never thought like i uh, with like some with matt we would have a ca- capability to do what we've done so i think like you don't have to come from the background fully um and so it doesn't have to be like you know fully um nurtured if i can if i can say that but like it 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 you, you the, there is an element of like you do need certain undercurrents i think to succeed well and i would say to your point earlier about uh, the learning i mean you guys are clearly uh, there's a there's a term you're probably familiar with it the infinite learner so uh, it seems like you guys are probably you're know, banging that sort of description the real enjoyment uh, and desire to kind of continually learn more is obviously what it seems to me is it, it really helps you on propel you on that journey of of, of progression <laughs> As business psychologist Stephanie Thompson mentioned earlier, competitiveness is a key input into motivation and drive. I wanted to explore this in more detail, so I shared with her a rather strange anecdote from my own early days as an entrepreneur involving a squash ball, of all things. I think you'll enjoy Stephanie's response to this, and she goes on to share some fascinating observations on the role of competition and passion. Stephanie, um, you know, a lot of people are driven by a sense of competition. Um, you know, mm-hmm. I, I remember when I started my my first business, um, going back a few years ago now, to G myself up for the launch of that business, I would go and play a game of squash by myself and pretend uh-huh. that, that, that my main competitor was the squash ball. Um, and I, I, I found that – now, that, you might find that disturbing, but I, I found that to be <laughs> – <laughs> strange admittedly right um but i i found that to be a really good motivator you know it was i mm. and i i now looking back on a, learning stuff from you in this chat now when i think about it that actually combines a couple of the different things at, at the one time i'm doing exercise i'm i've got that physiology going i'm really focused on that sort of short-term sort of goal of hitting the ball but i'm also projecting out in terms of a sense of um competition and visualization so uh, my question Mm -hmm. to you is knowing how important that is for entrepreneurs where does that sense of competitiveness come from uh, in a person you know is that is is it sort of again is this something more learned you know in childhood and adolescence or is it sort of ingrained some of it will appear ingrained 
uh, it can come from childhood. Sibling rivalry is classic in that all young animals, including humans, mm. are, well, maybe not all, but most young animals are programmed to compete with each other for resources from the parents. Yep. So they do that unless that behavior is contained and managed quite carefully by the parents. So some of it is innate. There are gender differences on this one, actually. It's one of competitiveness is one of the few traits that have genuine, quite substantial gender differences on the majority of traits that we have stereotypes about. The true differences are really quite small. But competitiveness, there is a difference where males do tend to be much more so. Um, at least the overtness of it. Okay. I suspect that competitiveness in males is just more demonstrative and in females a little bit more wily, perhaps, mm -hmm. more mm -hmm. subtle. Yep. Um, and there are, is a cultural factor there as well in that competitive behaviour is encouraged in some cultures, stereotype being the US, um, and less so in other cultures. So parts of Asia would not look so well upon overt competitive behaviour. And do you think that... Um a strong competitive streak is necessary for that drive um, to become a successful disruptive entrepreneur? Necessary, no. Okay. I think it's it can be very powerful when it's present, but there are so many other sources of drive that I would not suggest that it's a requirement by any means. In fact, sometimes it could even get in the way. Yeah. A, a win at any cost kind of motivation could backfire ultimately. And how does passion play into drive? Mm. It's a popular word, isn't it? A popular concept, passion. Uh, I put it under the heading of enthusiasm. Okay, yeah. Though yeah. it's more of a targeted enthusiasm, so a particular field or a topic. Mm -hmm. um, and it can also exist in quiet personalities. This is something that's occurring to me as, as we chat in that we think of some of these behaviors as being somehow obvious on the surface, but you can have very passionate driven people who have a quiet interpersonal style. The importance of competitiveness to the mindset of disruptive entrepreneurs was backed up by another entrepreneur I spoke with for this series. Chris Brikey is the founder and CEO of share investing platform stockspot.com. Based in Sydney, Australia, they've got $400 million under management and they're scaling fast. I think I read or heard early on in my sort of journey of setting up the business that like on day one as an entrepreneur, you're the only one with the vision and the idea. And so you can't expect everyone else to kind of understand it or see the vision. And it is really your job to bring on other people into the journey. And so I remember taking that to heart and, and, and therefore never really feeling too bad when people kind of disagreed or said it wasn't possible or said it was a waste of time. Cause I said, well, that's great. I mean, that, that means I'm onto something that, you know, it, it, that no one else has already thought of or no one else has thought is worth doing. Um, and it's, you know, it didn't reduce my motivation, actually increase my motivation. Wow. So, and I think maybe that's a characteristic that's probably similar for a lot of entrepreneurs as well is you need to accept that you're going to get a lot of no's and, um, you know, look for learnings rather than look for the disappointments of no's um, because, yeah, there's going to be a lot of doors that get shut in your face and a lot of paths that get blocked and you've got to have the resilience to, you know, keep on fossicking for the next door that can open for you and, and never give up. And, yeah, that I mean, that's another, I guess, thing that I was always instilled to me as, as a kid. I mean, we did a lot of sport as, as, as kids and, yeah, definitely growing up, the, the not giving up mentality was something that was drilled into us. Uh, well, I can see that. Yes, it's pretty evident already. Uh, and, and so um, that's what you've just touched on there. Is so I, mean, I would say is probably how most people would describe it, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> well, what you've just touched on there as well, I think is, is really uh, interesting. Um, where you, you, you were doing a lot of sport as, as a child, right? So, you know, turning our attention away from... Thank you for that. There's so, so many good insights on the different traits that you've used so far in your journey. But obviously another aspect another aspect of all this is um, what you could broadly term as drive. You know, like nothing uh, like what you've built at Stockspot is built without a lot of drive, right? So, you know, you've really got to keep pushing the whole time. You've got to be prepared to 
you know, work your ass off, basically. Yeah, and, and sometimes it'll be easier, not a bit more chill than other times. But there's a lot of drive in this. Now, drive can come in different ways or from different um, sources. You mentioned sport. So what I'm interested in now, Chris, is about the source of your drive. Now, is it is it from a sense of ambition, right, to create something you know, substantial? Or is it more from a sense of competition, you know, which might come from doing a lot of sport when you're earlier have you thought about that uh yeah it's a good question i mean for me it's not really it doesn't i mean i'm a competitive person i i would say very openly but i don't actually think the passion for starting the business came from the competitive side for me i mean one i you know for me it seemed like a big opportunity but really i thought it was a way to kind of um redress a wrong basically that was happening so i i mean i i've always felt very strongly about doing the right thing for the little guy and the person that's getting kind of ripped off and you know whenever i've seen people get ripped off whether it's friends or family members it always makes me really pissed off like i always go into bat for the person that's getting ripped off because i always get annoyed when someone in society who knows more and and you know has that extra information like uses it in a way that like abuses that that extra knowledge and so, so you're very purpose-led then would it be fair to say you're very purpose-led yeah so that's how i describe it is i mean for, for me the the business was very kind of purpose-driven i just thought you know, not only was it a purpose I was passionate about, but it had, you know, there, there was enormous ramifications. So, yeah. you know, you can have purpose about something, but even if you get it right, it can have very little impact. I thought, you know, it, I have a lot of passion for something and, and there's a clear purpose. And actually, if you can get it right, the impact is enormous on actual people's lives. And that's actually what's great to see now is when clients kind of call up and, you know, we, we see them, you know, on, on live chat or email or calling us saying, you know, thank you. Like this has really had a great impact on my life. I've, you know, I've changed how I've, I've been investing from this old way where this was happening to this, or, you know, I'm taking a lot less risk or I'm able to sleep better at night. Like hearing those stories are what makes me really excited because, um, you know, what I'm hearing is I, you know, you've helped solve this problem that I didn't realize was a problem or I didn't realize there was a solution to. So, um, yeah, for me, I mean, it's a combination of you need to have that passion. For me, that passion is largely driven by purpose. But then I guess what keeps me going is like the resilience and, and the competitive nature because like I, the purpose is so strong for me that I'm, I can, you know, c- commit to keep on getting over those hurdles that keep on getting put in our way. And what's your favourite sport? Do you, uh, do you play any sport these days? I mean, I was in the unfortunate position in my family. So I'm one of five kids where I was – probably of the five, the the least talented. But I, I come from a pretty sporty family. So I, as the oldest of the five as well, I felt like I was always helping to train the other kids, but they always quickly became better at, than me at the sports, whether oh. it was... Um, so we did a lot of tennis as kids um, and, and soccer were probably our two main sports. Yep. Um, but my two sisters became fantastic ten- tennis players, you know, played over in the US. One played the Aussie Open juniors. Oh, you know, wow. my brothers became great basketball and soccer players. Um, I think the only thing I can potentially say I'm, I'm up there within the family with net these days is table tennis. Table um, tennis. Because as a startup, we obviously have a table tennis table in our office and I get a bit of practice. Well, I've got to say, it sounds, uh, sounds like a very high-achieving family. Um, uh, I, I think if I, if I came to lunch at your place on Sunday, I'd, I'd, I'd sort of break out in the sweat. Uh, you know, it's, 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 what, what's the conversation like around the dinner table? It must be... Uh, uh, it must be fairly intense, yeah? You'd physically break out in the sweats because you'd already be challenged to a game of table tennis. You'd probably <laughs> be going for a run around the yard. So, um, no, I mean, uh, as a family, I guess there's a lot of families that kind of follow sport and watch sport. Yeah. I guess our family was different in that we never ever were really big fans of sporting teams. Like, my memories of kid as a kid was never going to watch teams, you know, watch rugby league or AFL, mm. although we did sometimes do that. It was really just playing a lot of playing, sport. Playing, playing. Yeah, we were training and playing all the time. See, and that leaves its mark, doesn't it? You know, if you're competing, you know, you've got a big family, it's four siblings uh, with you as well. So, you know, the, the intra-family competition, uh, that stuff, that's wiring your brain in a certain way, uh, you know, with, without even knowing it. And, and I'm, obviously we're talking about you as an example, but I'm, I mean in a, in, a more, in a wider sense, you know, as children develop... It's the environment that they, they live in and that they grow in. It's what they, they live and breathe every day that leaves its mark, uh, in my view, anyway. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah, intra-sibling rivalry definitely uh, leads to, yeah, 
a desire not to be the, the, the bottom of bottom rung when it comes to the, the family ladder. So yeah, well, definitely. You know, you're the CEO you know. of, of, a, of an investing platform with $400 million under management. I think it's turned out okay, Chris. I think, I think, I think you've won. You've won. Well, yeah, the other lesson I learned from doing a lot of sport is there's no such thing as winning because each game is just one of a series of many games. And so yeah. I think that's something I remember as a kid, I used to take it very seriously when you lost a game of soccer or lost a game of tennis. But when I, yeah, I think it took a bit of maturity to kind of realize that each individual game is meaningless in life. Like it, it's, it's a combination of all those games and what you learn from the matters. <laughs> So the problem we set out to solve in this episode was how to leverage ambition and competitiveness to boost your entrepreneurial drive. Our mindset expert, Stephanie Thompson, revealed the psychological theory behind drive and our startup guru, Rachel Newman, explained why this is so important in a founder. And we've also heard some fascinating real-life stories from our entrepreneur guests, Jonty Hurstovit at Defer It!, and Chris Breike from Stockspot. I hope their wisdom and insights have given you ideas to crack the code to growth in your own business. For me, there are four key learnings that we can all take from this episode. Number one, there's a strong physical component to entrepreneurial drive. As Stephanie explained, dopamine, hormones, exercise, and even thyroid are all factors that feed into motivation and activity. So if you're naturally a more sedentary person, you may need to change up your routine and get more physical if you want more drive. Number two, leverage your purpose. I loved what Chris from Stockspot had to say on this. For him, there was a strong ethical component that drove him to launch the business. Redressing a wrong on behalf of consumers was and remains a key motivator. Number three, use passion to drive growth. This has been a big source of the drive for Jonty and the team at Defer It and has helped them solve problems, push through the pain barrier and ultimately to become number one in their niche. As we heard in the Elon Musk story at the top of the episode, a strong drive can propel you further and faster than you ever imagined. And in the case of Musk, even as outsiders, we can see clear evidence of many of the traits we've heard our guests talk about today. He's passionate, he's goal-driven, he has incredible physical endurance, and he's purpose-led. He states as his mission for SpaceX to maintain the light of consciousness to make sure it continues into the future. Now, decoded, that means his purpose is literally to preserve the ongoing viability of the human species. That's a pretty bold vision. He's also hyper-competitive. When Jeff Bezos recently tweeted about Amazon's success, Musk responded with a silver medal emoji to rub his face in the fact that Musk has the larger fortune. Now, that might strike you as childish or petty, but his Twitter fans loved it, of course, and presumably so do the legions of investors in Tesla and SpaceX who benefit from this competitive streak. It might be unrealistic for the mere mortals amongst us to aim for the superhuman feats that we observe in elite entrepreneurs, but one thing is certain. There is not merely correlation between hard work and success. There is causation too. If you're ambitious for your business, your team, or for yourself, you need to find the right mix of motivators that can inspire you to work harder for longer. Whilst there's more than one way to the top, the road is almost always paved in blood, sweat, and tears. We're coming to the end, but before we go, it's time for our regular segment, Nerd Superpower, where a guest has to share one attribute or skill that gives them the edge in their market. Let's find out who our super nerd is today. So, uh, Jonty, we now come to another recurring segment uh, here at Nerds of Business called... Nerd Superpower. So, Nerd Superpower, uh, you are today our Bill Now Pay Later nerd. Um, what's, uh, if you had to sort of break it down, you're obviously a, a person with a, a, a lot of good experience, a, a wide skill set, uh, and, and very much a thirst for learning. If you had to sort of pinpoint one superpower um, that's 
really been key to you know getting to getting you to where you are today? What would it be? Uh, that's a good one. I, I, again, I think we've actually maybe even covered it. Um, I'd say my one suit, like I'll always meet people like I'll never, like you, I, you can never say, um, when you meet, like you, you meet other people, like you always meet people that are cleverer than you or see the world in a much better fashion or have better ideas. Um, the one superpower I think I do have is I think my ability to certainly, certainly focus and put the yards in, um, I've, I've always found I've been able to outwork people or competition. Um, and that's kind of been my superpower. Um, maybe it's like a more a grunt force type of thing, but definitely like if I, if, if I, if I need to put the, the guns down and go for it, like I, like I can, I can sit at a desk for a very, very long time without leaving. So I think that I would have to say that's my superpower. And, which and is probably uh, a lame one, but well, anyway. no, it's, it's a good one. But I, I'm kind of, I'm a little concerned about your staff, Jonty. I mean, like, what, uh, what's, what's the work environment there like at, at Defer? It. I mean, when they, when the staff see you kind of come to the office, sit down at the desk, is it, is it like, oh, oh my God, he's he's in for a long one today. I'm going to have to stay back as well. Uh, not really. So what I do is, um, firstly, because we're very conscious of culture. So the first thing is I, my, my schedule now is I go to bed quite early and I'm up very, very early. Yeah, right. So what I generally do is if, if I am in the office, I'll leave at about 5.30 just so I can set the example for most people. Uh, and then when I get home, I'll have dinner or whatever. And then I log back in and I finish my work. So home. I do leave the yeah. office. I don't sit in the office and set try and create that environment which is something very prominent working as a lawyer but yeah. basically the environment we work under and we still work hard there are people that will have to work late on certain nights of is course. it's all about like you basically your own owner and so if you need to get something done it's up to you to execute on it but equally if you don't have anything to do then and you can go home early go home early so thanks for listening to episode 29 of the nerds of business podcast if you've enjoyed it please leave a review on Apple, Spotify, Google, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. It helps us climb up the ranks and become more visible to other people just like you. Remember, we want to help as many entrepreneurs and businesses as possible. If you've got a question or some feedback, we'd love to hear from you. You can engage with us at our website, nerdofbusiness.com. That's nerdofbusiness.com. So feel free to reach out and say hello. I want to thank all of our guests and the team at WebBuzz for helping me put this show together. We'll be back in two weeks with our next episode, which is on When Entrepreneurs Go Bad, Negative and Destructive Behaviours That Ruin People and Kill Companies. Until then, I'm your host, Darren Moffat, and I look forward to nerding out with you next time. Bye for now. 